Hi, welcome to the open space with Aura. I'm very excited to have Alex Zubatov today having conversation with me. It's a person I didn't know anything about until I read his um, essay uh, in Aereo magazine, which resonated with me so much that I decided to contact Alex and we started talking and here I have Alex here. And Alex, do you want to introduce yourself in a way you would like to introduce yourself besides what I said before our conversation? Um, what should I say? Uh, well, I'm a lawyer in New York. Um, hopefully, hopefully I'm more interesting than that. Um, I, I think the essay that you referred to uh, in Area, which I, I, I think the beginning of it is, the be it's a long title, but the beginning of it is called uh, um, Aesthetic Denialism. Yes. Um, th that kind of gives a background about why I'm a lawyer and not what I would love to be doing in a saner world, uh, which would be to be spending my time um, in whether in an academic setting or, or some, some sort of setting where I could do it professionally on literature and philosophy um, and art, which are my true interests and which I spend as much of my free time engaged in anyway as I can. Um, but the essay kind of explains why, why I didn't do that and why I chose to go to law school um, in the current environment. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. We'll, we will touch upon that and maybe we won't. That's yes, better. it's interesting because uh, you mentioned the beginning, uh, it's exactly uh, the article uh, that I refer to, aesthetic denialism. And uh, as a musician, uh, especially lately, but through all my teaching career, because I perform and I teach in college and I work with little children and I work with different ages, it's, it's, beca it's be becoming more and more urgent, urgent to me to try to preserve that aesthetics that sense of beauty, which uh, I feel about to get lost. And the words of um, Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky, of course, come to mind. The words of he, one of his character, Count Mishkin from Idiot, beauty will save, save the, the world. world. And this, uh, this sentence haunts me since, I think, sixth grade or seventh grade. That's when I first read. Dostoevsky, and I was thinking, was Dostoevsky idiot himself? Uh, was he so naive? Isn't it apparent? Isn't it obvious that beauty cannot save the world? Look at the world. Look what's going on. And it still haunts me. And um, on the other hand, I meet people of different ages, little kids, adults, retired people, students, who I see it are uh, craving, are uh, starved for that sense of be getting in touch with something beautiful. They tell it to me. But it's not in the institutions. It's somehow, at least myself, I'm trying to pass hand to hands, person to person. Um, but I think about myself in my past, in my youth years, I couldn't find it in Russia where I grew up in, in my institutions. It's always was one person who would inspire me, who would ignite that passion and uh, make me look different than things. And it struck me how you describe your professor, Alan Bloom, 
Harold, Harold Bloom. Harold, Harold Bloom, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all with those two blooms and they always get confused, but yes. Yes, yes. Uh, and how you speak, spoke about him and can you, can you not retell, but something drove you to write what you wrote, some deep sense of, it felt to me, I cannot speak on your behalf, some kind of barney nostalgia or something. Uh, yeah, um, well, I guess it's, it is, uh, one one big difference between traditional culture, high culture, and what we have going on now, um, and what I called, uh, I, I think the uh, a few more words in that title is uh, of the essay is aesthetic denialism and the birth of ac academia. Um, Is, is that traditional culture can inspire, can compel high culture, I'm talking about, that it casts that spell of beauty that you refer to in Dostoevsky, uh, Schiller is another strong proponent of that capacity of beauty to elevate human beings. It's something that can elevate us and excite us. And what I saw starting to take shape when I was in college at Yale in the early to mid nineties and what has since metastasized especially in the past few years, is a kind of anti-culture. Um, it is something where that kind of profound, beautiful heritage of, I, I, I'm gonna say of the West, but it, it's not limited to the West. I don't care if it's of the West, of the East, of, of anything. That, that's not what I'm focused on but the heritage that we have, we as a society have, is being uh, attacked from within the places that should be most devoted to its preservation. T.S. T.S. Eliot in uh, his uh, long essay, or you can call the book long essay, um, notes toward the definition of culture refer to the main function of the universities as the preservation of, of culture, the preservation of learning. And they're not doing that, that. They're doing the exact opposite of that. They are leading, leading the attack upon it um, from the standpoint of the most superficial possible considerations that uh, I, I could imagine. And so, you know, you talked about a burning nostalgia. I, I thought about my college experience when I feel like the, that period of the early to mid nineties was um, a, a period where you could still see uh, bits and pieces of what was once there and you could also see the coming collapse. Um, and, and that in a nutshell is why I didn't go into academia because uh, I saw in the younger professors, especially, I, I was an English major, I saw in the younger professors that they didn't seem, they were still you know, very capable, very competent, very intelligent, uh, more than capable of analyzing the literature that we were reading and of presenting it to us. But I saw that their main passions and their interests were elsewhere. They were not in, in the text. They were uh, not even in, uh, let's say, the historical considerations that directly inspired the text. Uh, they were in these extraneous political categories that uh, we all are now uh, all too intimately familiar 
um, with whether it's race or gender or uh, heteronormativity or, or any of these uh, kinds of things. And uh, frankly, it just wasn't interesting to me. It's, it's, it's exciting for a, a little bit as an undergraduate, you know, you, you've learned about theory and, um, and oh, wow, there are all these very uh, fascinating concepts that these uh, deep thinkers uh, came up with. But, but ultimately, those concepts are not nearly as deep as uh, the actual stuff that you're reading. And that's what I wanted my professors to be interested in. And I, in, and I saw that these departments were not going in that direction. Now, the, the essay that you're referring to, a large, large part of it spoke about my experience of Harold Bloom. And uh, many people will be generally familiar with him for those who aren't. He's a, um, a professor of uh, literature. I think, I think he was formally listed in the humanities department. Uh, he, he was a department of one, as he liked to say about himself, um, who was uh, wrote tons of and tons of books. Some of the most famous titles are The Anxiety of Influence, uh, The Western Canon. Um, and he, he died uh, a, a year or two ago uh, at a ripe old age. But I, I took three different classes with him. And um, it was a singular experience because he did it, it was definitely a, it was a challenging experience probably for many people because he wasn't one of these professors who you know everyone is familiar with this from maybe a high school or college literature class or, or many other classes where the professor asks some sort of question and the student gives a response and the professor tries to be nice about it uh, even when the student's response is completely uh, out of left field and is ungrounded and the, the, the professor might say, yeah, oh yeah, that's interesting. So you're getting at this and this and this and the professor will try to rephrase the student's contribution in a way that, that makes it, makes it uh, useful to the class. And there's definitely value in that and not, not destroying people's egos and, and having them feel engaged in, in the class even while you're taking their point and making it into something that's actually worthwhile for everyone. Bloom didn't do that. Um, I, I remember uh, very crisply him telling him uh, responding to some student with a shake of his head like this. Uh, he asked, had asked some sort of question. Um, usually, I, I don't like telling students they're absolutely wrong, but my dear, and, and that was a typical response. You had to leave your ego at the door. Um, and I was perfectly fine with that because as recompense for that, what you got is someone who was so deeply engaged and so passionate about the material he was teaching. I took one, uh, one class, two classes on Shakespeare with him and one on uh, modern poetry. You felt and I, th I think I said this, this expressed this very idea in the essay, you felt during those, it was a two hour seminar uh, each week, you, you felt during those two hours, like you were in a hypnotic trance, like you were doing the most profound, important work you could possibly be doing in this world in analyzing this, this moment in Shakespeare, this poem, whatever it was. And, uh, if you did not come away from that, under that spell, there was something wrong with you. Uh, and I think most people did. And, that, and, and that's why, uh, as, again, as long as they could leave their ego at the door, um, yeah. that, that, that was critical. And, and, and not worry about, you know, is he treating the, the students like this or like that, or, or who he is yeah. as, a, as a person, just listen to, to him. And, and uh, he had, uh, he was famous for, um, his memory, he um, uh, had all of Milton completely memorized by heart, all, pretty much all of Shakespeare. And uh, it was a, 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 an incredible visual and uh, auditory memory combined. He, he wasn't sitting there, you know, 
uh, going through to memorize something, it, it would happen because you would read and reread and reread and muse about passages. And so at any moment, he could just close his eyes and recite a passage from some play or, 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 or some moment. It, he had that tradition at his disposal and that's really what you need in order to be, um, in order to understand literature on its own terms. Um, but yeah, that that's that's kind of what uh, what the essay was about, and I, I I really do think that that the vast majority you, you talked about. Um, many of your students and many of the people you interact with today being hungry for that, for an experience of the beautiful. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes, often, you need someone to guide you through it. Yes, and it's interesting because uh, I always give disclaimer even to families who wants their children to study with me, I, I tell them in advance, you know what, if you expect me to be nice, I'm the wrong person <laughs> because oftentimes it will be uncompromising, brutally honest experience. And that's what you describe. And I remember my teacher once spent almost four hours working with me obsessively on one single phrase of music composition. It was uh, Schumann's Fantasia. And she totally got into some obsessive trance. She was incredibly passionate. She had, she tried to get something out of me and I knew what she, and I couldn't get there. And we both were trying to get there and finally we got there and it was that ecstatic feeling it was, I couldn't stand here for doing that to me. It was kind of, again, my ego was completely crushed. And then it was ecstatic, ecstatic feeling that I got to something which I couldn't hear before and I can hear it now. Right. And that's, that moment is irreplaceable. Yeah, yeah, I, I, unfortunately so much, uh, pedagogy today is committed to this belief that we must be affirmed in our, often you hear affirmed in our identities. All, all students must, must be affirmed um, in their identities um, so that when we get to uh, a, a college classroom, the tone has to be one of affirmation that whatever you are and whatever you as a student bring is is okay and is is not just okay but, but great um and I, I always think of that oft quoted kafka line um that that education and culture have to be like an ice axe for the frozen sea inside of us very different vision but it's it's uh an idea that no we, we should not be expect, should not expect to be affirmed through an educational experience. We should expect to be shaken to our very foundations. Uh, yeah, and and that's the process that challenges us to arrive at something new and better. Um, I, I, obviously, I'm not talking about gratuitous cruelty of of some professor just being abusive because yeah, they enjoy yeah. being abusive. I, I, yeah. I'm talking about the inherent difficulty of great culture. Absolutely. And it's interesting because I'm reading now a book of George Steiner, uh, Real Presence, and he writes, his vision of university is very simple. I even have it here in front of me that university should house and honor anarchic provocation and passion for uselessness and provocation of the mind, I think it's deeply missing 
it's uncomfortable, right? When we're provoked by uncomfortable ideas, we cannot hide behind our identities. That's right. So why do you think it's done? Well, it puzzles me. Why, why is uh, there the Re -re Why this constant reaffirmation reaffirm of comfort of identity, of yeah. safety, wh why? Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a complicated question. I mean, you can, you can, and you can go in several different directions with it. One is, uh, the Jonathan Haidt, Greg Lukianoff idea from Coddling of the American Mind, the recent, um, book from a few years ago about, the the birth of, uh, self-esteem culture, um, in, in the way that children were reared in the nineties and how they constantly need to be uh, affirmed uh, because they were raised in this uh, in this very protective way at a time when society in fact was never safer and and uh, the result is we get all of these very brittle people with fragile egos um, and, and there's certainly something to that I, I think there's absolutely something to that idea um, but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that uh, what I would say is that, over time, due to technological changes, what we've experienced is the flattening out of consciousness. Um, what I mean by that is, so you, you can imagine starting out at a point when literacy was, uh, was reserved for just a few people in society and and to the extent of their liter the extent of their literacy was limited to reading and rereading the same texts, right? The Bible, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever it may have been, right? Um, and you deeply understood those texts by the time that that you were reading the same passage for the uh, hundredth time. Or you can think of the Greeks knowing Homer by heart before the advent of writing, especially that, that Plato lamented um, because of, of how he anticipated it would destroy people's memories. The advent of writing externalizes culture. It takes it from inside us in our memories, like Bloom had in his memory, puts it out, out on paper. Now we know it's, it's, it's out there. When the printing press comes around, that reflects another step in that chain. Uh, obviously, I'm not here saying, oh, the printing press was, it was a horror any more than I'm saying the invention of writing was, was horrible. But, but we have to understand what these technological changes do. Um, when the printing press comes into being, now you have the capacity, for, of course, for texts to be mass produced and, uh, and you have the proliferation of writings, some great, some not so great, because now you didn't have to think quite as hard about, well, is this, is this thing and book I'm putting out there worth it because it became easier to, mm -hmm. to do it. And um, so that's another step in, in the kind of a flattening out, what I'm calling flattening out of human consciousness. Um, skipping many centuries, when you get to the internet, when you get to television, all of these audiovisual media. First of all, with the internet, everything is at our disposal, right? Um, we don't need to remember a thing because uh, at any moment you just go on Wikipedia and, and, and you think you've found something out. And and by the way, Harold Bloom in, one, in an interview, I remember he had a good um, 
quote about the internet, someone, someone had asked him about what he thinks of the internet and the fact that it's now making all of this knowledge accessible to students like never before. And, and Bloom said that he's highly skeptical of that great gray ocean of the internet, as he called it, because how in that mass of information are you supposed to distinguish information from knowledge, much less knowledge from wisdom? So I think what happens over time is we are inundated with texts, the overwhelming majority of them being completely insignificant, momentary blips on the screen. And speaking of the screen, that, that is another issue. Our culture has become incredibly audiovisual. And the way that most people growing up today are experiencing, are, are being introduced to our culture is primarily audiovisual. Audiovisual, you see these babies in their strollers looking at, at a screen. Um, and, and you know, usually when I see that, I, I have to kind of walk past quickly to, to avoid thinking about it too hard um, because it, it, it does scare me. I'm not against audiovisual culture. I love movies. I love great movies. But the problem is that they that that the prevalence of audiovisual culture and the proliferation of culture as a whole flattens out our consciousness. It it takes it, there's less and less in here and more and more out there. And particularly with regard to, to difficult texts that require immersion, reading, rereading, we're not prepared for it anymore. Students are not prepared for it. And so this is a roundabout way of getting back to your question. Why do students feel the need to be affirmed? Well, you get a student who comes into a university uh, like Yale, where I went, or, or any any university that has a, uh, or had, I should say, a good literature program, or, or it doesn't have to be literature, literature, philosophy, whatever it is, and put in front of them some text, Homer, the Bible, Shakespeare, romantic poetry, whatever it is, what are they what are they going to do with it they're not prepared for it they are not they, they are there's too great a gulf at this point between where they are and the the kinds of expectations that these texts had of their readers at at a certain point in time uh, and the result when there's when that gulf is too great is that we turn away and we crave, we crave an out, a way of dismissing this. Sour grapes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, it's not, the, the fault lies not in me, but, but, but in this. I'm not the problem. And unfortunately, at the same time, you had a welling up of ideologies that gave credence and substance to that fundamental impulse of resentment. Uh, Bloom, by the way, referred to, to these ideologies as the schools of resentment, channeling the, the Nietzschean notion mm -hmm. um, of, of resentment, um, but, but also the common everyday notion of resentment. So it's, it's very appealing for a student who just doesn't want to be spending hours and hours immersed in something that is above his or her head to embrace instead a facile 
dismissal of that whole body of that whole canon, let's say, by recourse to critical theory, uh, various postmodernist approaches that have morphed, of course, into they, they've combined with uh, neo-Marxist approaches into uh, post-colonial theory and all, all, all of these things. And I, I can go, yeah. I can talk about that much more specifically, uh, but you know, it's, it's uh, as you want, but it's, it's something that's been discussed in many places, but um, those, those ideas create a skeleton that uh, that has been uh, embodied with that resentment and that erects this uh, anti-canonical structure built on hatred where it's easy for the students to say, oh, oh, this is this is all just dead white males. This is yeah. this is all a product of hegemony and colonialism and slavery and. Uh, but it's also easy to easy to deconstruct, because critical theory offers us wonderful device, sometimes useful device of deconstruction, but it does not give us any tools of building building cathedral or building beautiful melody or building beautiful poetic line oh that's that's right it's think about it. it's deconstruction it's yes. anti-racism it's antifa anti-fascism yeah. right mm -hmm. uh, all of these ideologies are um are built upon opposition to something and this kind of kind of kind of gets back to what I started with, which is that the the tradition can inspire and excite. You need to put yourself into it. You need to be challenged. You need to you need to put that initial investment in. But if you do, the rewards are incredible. On the other hand, these ideologies, uh, they're instant gratification. Uh, you know, the storming of the barricades is, is the kind of pleasure people, people get from that, the hurling of rocks through a window, through a stained glass window. Um, there's a pleasure of transgression that everyone, particularly people at a certain age, feel. But that pleasure isn't lasting. Exactly. You know yeah. what puzzles me? I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, go ahead. Because I have this funny image. It, it, it seemed to be like typical phase for maybe a teenager to go through this phase, rebellion against. Right. But it's somehow it's cultivated in educational institutions, this teenagerish behavior, it's cultivated and it's very strange to see adults engage in this behavior. Or maybe, I just don't know, we'll have to see, or maybe it's something that people will outgrow in themselves? Do you think it's a short-lived phase or it will be so much ingrained in people that it won't be a phase anymore? Um, well. How long one can live with this yeah. poisonous resentment inside one start feeling empty, destroyed and start seeking for something? something greater yeah I, I i think um part of what we're seeing is the end result of a countercultural moment that began in the 1960s mm -hmm. i i have to 
make recourse here to uh, uh, the, the book, The Fourth Turning, what William Strauss and Neil Howe. It's a, uh, a theory of uh, generational change, of generational cycles. Um, and there, there are many kind of quirky, quasi mystical things in, in, in the book, but the, um, that you can question. But the fundamental theory is in general that we always have a kind of a succession of generations and to short circuit that it repeats again and again. And to short circuit the idea, the essence of it is that there's a crisis, okay? Uh, war, revolution, uh, massive social dislocation, whatever it is. After the crisis, what happens is that the people who lived through that crisis and who fought, whether literally fought or, or fought in, with their souls and their ideas in the course of that crisis, they understood how much is at stake in the chaos that was unleashed. And so they come back from the literal or figurative war and they build up a new order that, that they've been craving. So you can think of the extended crisis that happened um, that encompasses the two world wars and the depression in the middle and the generation that comes back from that um, builds up a, a culture that's predictable and stable. You think of America in the 1950s, um, but it, common touchstones, leave it to beaver, that, that kind of idea of mm -hmm. very, what for, for people thinking about it today was very repressive and, and um, very uh, stable in a, in a way that we think of now almost as negative. So that culture comes into being and then a new generation is born, the baby boomer generation, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they grow up after the crisis and they, they were born right after the war. They never saw the war, they never experienced the war. And they're growing up in this culture which they see as repressive. They don't understand, they can be taught, but it's hard to deeply feel why it's repressive. Or sorry, why, why that culture was necessary to compensate for the crisis that happened before, is what I meant to yeah. say. And so they start uh, during a period that, that the authors of the book refer to as the awakening. Um, they start rebelling against the repression that they see. And so we have the counterculture of the 60s. Um, and, and this the same pattern the authors find again and again throughout history. This is just the mm -hmm. most recent cycle of it. And at first the rebellion is just limited to this, this generation that's youth movement. Uh, gradually, as these people get older, as they become um, more influential in society, the, the people who are 60s radicals become ensconced in the universities as faculty mm -hmm. and they come of age. And by the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, right? These people are in more and more of a position of influence and the entire 60s counterculture and the ideas that inform that culture are now institutionalized. And from the universities, it seeps out into the larger, into the larger wider world as you get generations of students now being taught by these people. And so then, we go through a period called the unraveling and then a new crisis. And I, and I think we're at this point clearly, clearly in that crisis now. Um, it's it's yeah. um, at, a, at a point where the, the revolutionary energy of that 60s generation has spilled over and become part of 
uh, virtually every aspect of our culture today. And what you see as a result is the appearance of a deep fissure in our society between those people who are all on board the express train of the revolution and those people who are on the one hand standing up for high culture, but on the other hand, I, I'm not gonna deceive myself that everyone who's against uh, this revolutionary energy is, is, is saying we need Shakespeare. Uh, a, a lot of it is um, a, just a traditional conservative energy from where people are feeling like they're, they're being attacked um, mm -hmm. in every aspect of their lives. And so at some point that's going to come to a head even more so than it is now. And, and this is the answer to your question. I, I, it can't continue. At some point it's going to be resolved in yeah. some sort of new synthesis. What that new synthesis is going to be is difficult to say, yeah. um, but we, there's there's no way we can keep living like this uh, no. culturally, politically. It, it just, it's not gonna work. You know what my worry is? The words are, remember in the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that years ago when you were a student, you already would see signs of where it all goes, yet there were bits of, and pieces of tradition. My worry is that what we call old school that I have deep rev reverence for, the best of old school will be completely lost and buried to such a degree that we won't be able to dig it out. That we will have no, no bricks left to rebuild or to bring forward some sort of renaissance. Or yeah. maybe we are way more creative and way more resilient. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have the same, uh, I'm of two minds in the same way that you are. There's a, uh, uh, there's someone named Rod Dreher of the American Conservative Magazine who, uh, uh, what, one of his, most well-known books is called the Benedict Option, uh, and and he he really argues that we're going to have to take to the monasteries again, literally or figuratively, meaning that that culture is going to it, we're entering a new dark ages, and uh, a culture is going to have to be preserved by a by a few dissidents, yeah, kind of dissident culture, right? Right, passionate adherents who um, right who retreat into their more private worlds and hold out until a new renaissance can can take place and maybe that's right i don't i don't know if that's right um i you know i also think in this connection of um the conflict between uh uh walter benjamin and theodore adorno um about the revolutionary potential of new culture and new technology. So um, Benjamin in his most, most famous essay, Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, um, argued that um, he, 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 he was uh, talking about the revolutionary potential of this new medium film that was coming into uh, prominence and contrasting that with this old technology, visual art, where traditional visual art, I should say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where the painting pushes away the viewer because it has what he called the aura the aura of originality, of singularity, of, of this, you know, this is, this is the work, the Mona Lisa um, adorned with the halo of its divine creator. And, and you uh, plebeian stand there yeah. and, and look with adoration, don't get too close. 
the pedestal, right. the pedestal right. that right. terrifies people and pushes people away, the sor sort of elitism. Yes. And um, Benjamin, with uh, his Marxist inclinations, saw that kind of art as fundamentally anti democratic. Um, and he, um, as many Marxists did initially, saw uh, the kind of political revolution as also um, as also bringing with it a cultural revolution where where you would have a wonderful cultural flowering. And he saw film as part of this because now you no longer have uh, this original, it's just a print, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you can think of the uh, Baudrillard's notion of simulacra, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's just a print and you're at no one, no one on this screen versus that screen watching this film is seeing the original. And so that that separation, that halo, that aura is dissolved. And what was interesting to him is that, look what's happening. You see these great films by Charlie Chaplin, for example, mm -hmm. being watched by common people, by simple people and being enjoyed just like, and side by side might, might be some high intellectual enjoying them as well. So that's, that's what he believed. Uh, Adorno, his colleague in the, in the Frankfurt School had a very different view, of course, and I'm sure you with your background in, yeah. in music are yeah. very, very familiar with that and about his yeah. views of, uh, he, he saw pop mass culture, yeah. right, pop culture yeah. and mass culture and, and for him, jazz was, uh, of course, uh, that, that as soon as you had music where someone could bop their head along to that syncopated beat and it, it was fascism. It was, um, it was, um, it was like you were nodding along to capitalism. Your masters had you. Yeah. Um, it, it's that gesture of affirming. It's that mindlessness. That's, that, that's, that's what he saw there in, in the mass, in, in mass culture, and of course, he and Horkheimer had their their famous mass culture essay, which paints a very compelling picture of how capitalism uh, takes culture and and uh, turns it into mass propaganda, essentially. Um, now, who who was right in that? Well, of course, I think neither was exactly right. But one thing I want to say about Benjamin and and bringing it back to what we were talking about is I think this is what he was missing the following. Why was film capable of taking um, the common man and the high intellectual and putting them side by side watching the same screen whereas when you thought about the old art forms whether painting or literature there was that class divide. Well because film and this is what he missed, was a new medium. And what that means is that same class division wouldn't have existed with Homer either. Everyone could enjoy Homer mm -hmm. because it was new. Traditions build upon themselves. They complexify. Mm -hmm. They create a language and the works of art that follow in their footsteps use that language to create something new. But what that means is that anyone trying as a viewer, reader, listener to appreciate what it is they're reading, seeing, hearing increasingly needs to be familiar with that language that keeps getting more and more complex and keeps getting built up. And film, because it was new at that moment, there wasn't that separation yet. It hadn't mm -hmm. yet elaborated uh, its, its own language. 
Now, if Benjamin were alive today, what would he see? I expect what he would see is a stark division, just like with every other art form, mm -hmm. between art film, serious film, and uh, blockbuster superhero movies. Right? You're not you're not going to see at this point the, those those same two people sitting side by side, the common man and the intellectual. Of course not. Uh, what you have, in, in in fact, are 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 intellectuals, people who style themselves as intellectuals, um, but who themselves don't have the cultural background to talk about what they're talking about, uh, what they should be talking about. Instead, they might be sitting side by side at the superhero movie and the mm -hmm. intellectual is trying to rationalize uh, why that superhero movie in fact is good culture. Um, you see a lot of that with TV as well. Yeah. And, you know, but but that's, that's, a, that's a different problem. Uh, it's related to the same problem, but so I, I, I think as any culture complexifies, you, you, you get this um, problem and, and Harold Bloom uh, had a quote in one of his uh, books that, that the Western, Western tradition was killed by its own past strength. That, that you get the, it just becomes more difficult. You can't help it. You need more and more of a steeping, more and more of a background and fewer and fewer of us do. And eventually um, poets are uh, professors who are writing for other professors because who else is going to read John Ashbery? Um, it's, it's um, that's your audience because those are the only people who are able to appreciate it. And then you have a stark division between um, serious poetry on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you get um, the, the uh, Instagram poet Rupi Kaur, uh, who, who is writing nonsense, but, but it's very popular. Or you get uh, Amanda Gorman, uh, um, right, the, the, the woman who read at Biden's inauguration, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, who's, I, I, she's uh, a, a photogenic uh, a woman of color with a uh, poem that everyone can understand, but serious poetry, it is not. Uh, even if you compare it to um, the, the initial inauguration poem at Kennedy's inauguration was composed by Robert Frost. And uh, read that one and see the difference, you know? But, but so everything kind of bifurcates in that way. Now, what's the, this is again, sorry for being long-winded, but this comes back to, to, to what you were asking about. Right now, we are still at the dawn of these new technologies. We're at the same point where Benjamin uh, was in in the 30s, watching mm -hmm. film take shape. So we're watching, we're seeing this um, all the all of the, all the audiovisual technologies, uh, TikTok and uh, whatever whatever else, uh, taking shape. And they seem accessible, and they seem it seems like something exciting is happening, and people it's democratizing. Over time, that same bifurcation is going to happen where I I, I do not dismiss TikTok. I, I, I dismiss it for some reasons, but I don't I don't I don't dismiss any of these technologies in themselves. They are fully capable of producing great stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um but over time, you will, we will have that division again in these technological domains as well, where th there's going to be the great, uh, the the great TikTok creation <laughs> that yeah. that channels a whole history and a whole mm -hmm. language, and the one that doesn't. Um, but I, I think a lingering problem with all this all this stuff is uh, again, you you need an educational system that takes people out of the immediacy of the present moment, which is so overwhelming. There's, there's the, the core problem is that there's just so much stuff uh, that we are inundated by right now. Uh, you know, how, how, you, if you were alive during, during the middle ages, how many new things would happen in your life? Yeah. Um, you could take the time to be immersed in, in uh, a great text. You didn't have CNN telling you yeah. there's breaking news 20 times a day. Um, all about the same thing. You didn't have constant notifications of nonsense. It's interesting uh, because uh, it seems that we have 
the most overwhelming amount of choices, things to choose from, and yet we are not given tools or knowledge to select and how to select, how to be selective. And what you talked about, that this natural selection of things inevitably will happen with new, with new medium, where we all, it's kind of novel, and yet inevitably there will be some sort of bubbles forming up more and more. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. it might be a good thing. I yeah, I, I, I think it is, but but yes, you, you said it exactly right that we we don't have the selection criteria or this or we don't have we don't have the curator to guide us through, mm -hmm. and that's what education should be about, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's so, yeah. So the role of a teacher will be reconsidered in some way, probably. Well. I think it's the same role as it always was in the sense yeah. that the, the role of the teacher is always to, to curate um, the student's experience through the tradition. Uh, it's going to, if you, if you mean, is it going to be reconsidered compared to what it is right now, where right now uh, teachers are, uh, too many teachers, I certainly don't want to say all because there's, there are some amazing ones out there, but too, too many teachers are, um, just uh, feeding students some sort of uh, preset mold of ideology that uh, uh, doesn't doesn't help anyone really. Um, but yeah, hopefully it will be reconsidered as compared to that. But but yeah. but I do think that the uh, the goal of a teacher is has always been that. Uh, experience of curation, but in addition, that experience that I described earlier with Bloom of modeling passion, uh, this uh, idea uh, from Rene Girard of uh, mediated desire that that we we uh, we desire the things we desire, not um, in some immediate way. You know, I see this and I want it, but rather um, by imitating models, other people. At a certain point, it was in this is Gerard's uh, the way the way Gerard describes it is at a certain point those those people were far above us. Whether it's you know the imitation of Christ uh, or the imitation of some king or no, nobility, right? The commoner aspiring to Im Im imitate and, and be and imitate an aristocrat, and over time, there's less and less distance between um, the person doing the desiring and the person that he is imitating until until we get what Gerard refers to as double mediation, where mm -hmm. uh, you have two people both imitating each other and and competing in this in this kind of crazy um, crazy one-upmanship, uh, where this, this double mirroring effect that uh, swallows up the actual object of desire. Um, but let's let's leave that aside and just focus on on, on the following, which is that. When I, I think a, a teacher and a parent as well um, should play this role of modeling for for initially for children for for teens for young people students um, um, of modeling desires for great things of of showing. Um, of infecting in a more common way, infecting kids with their passion. Um, that's that's how we get excited uh, by these things, and and these teachers, these parents, these teachers serve as a gateway for us. They they play that role of the mediator to allow us to 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 unlock the text and and to be motivated to find in it what they found there um and and then at some point we can we can assume that role on our own uh, and we don't need them as a mediator anymore uh but um but right now we don't have that we have teachers who are modeling the act of tearing things down um not all not all not, not all not all not all, not all. Not all. Some no. are don quixotes 
Yes, absolutely. So some are holding on on barricades. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm still teaching Mozart as a Mozart, not as white dead male. So, and that's how it will be. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. I won't get canceled. <laughs> right, it's, yeah, of course, yeah. Not everyone so, can, can stand up to the stones being thrown at them on a daily basis as they're doing that. But we all choose our battles, Yes, I think. But it's uh, your parent yourself, right? You, you have a daughter, I think. Yes. Yes. So what you do, what, what will be your advice to parents who really scared, who terrified with indoctrinations at school, who wants their kids to be curious and to grow up curious and thinking individuals? not not falling into trap of group think but becoming more independently thinking individuals so what will be your personal not advice even but what you do as a parent um so i i, I think i think the most important thing i remember this from my own childhood It's, it's a kind of a piece of a conventional advice that kids imitate not what follow, not what their parents tell them, but what their parents show them. Uh, meaning, if, you're, if your parents are keep telling you to put away your screen and start reading, but you see your parents sitting in front of, with their phones or in front of their TV all day, the, the real message is coming through, unfortunately, right? So, and, and I grew up in a household where uh, my parents were sitting around reading all the time. And, and then what would naturally happen is they would talk about what they read, right? Uh, there wasn't some sort of uh, deliberate effort. I'm sure there was, but, but the main the main brunt of it was not some deliberate effort to educate but a natural spilling over of your own culture onto your kids um so i i, I do suppose this goes more in the category of advice but my advice to parents is if you want to have your kids be truly educated and focused on high culture, uh, do it yourself. <laughs> uh, that, that's the best thing you can do. Show them, uh, immerse yourself in it. And then it'll, it'll seep out of your pores like the food you ate um, during the day, right? It, it's, it, and when your kids communicate with you, they, you know, kids are most, most kids, they, they will have a rebellious streak in them, many of them, but they're also eager to please in some ways. And if they know they want to connect with their parents, and if they know that the way to connect with their parents is to talk about some sort of uh, uh, moment of high culture, then, then that's, that's going to happen. Now, uh, of course, you're going to face competition from other sources, but but at least you will be you will be uh, one of those holdouts against um, the the anarchist revolution or whatever it is. Um, I I think that's the best thing you can do just just to to model it, um, educate yourself. I, I you, you and I spoke about this uh, yes. during an earlier yeah. conversation, but but. I, I, when, when I think about the role of, uh, of, edu of teachers and parents and all this in education, um, the, the best kind of school to me would engage the parents. It, they would be part of its educational mission. Um, and the, the parents would have homework. 
Um, Absolutely, yeah. Be because th then everyone is working toward the same end and, and you're, you're doing it as a family and as a community and you're building up that kind of community that uh, is much stronger together against the barbarian hordes uh, <laughs> that, that are that are overtaking it. Uh, so yeah, I, that's that well. Maybe right. it will be happening somehow. We will. I don't know. I, I see. I see so much dissatisfaction out there right now that I think people are waking up. I, I think. I think the charade is is coming to an end. <laughs> um, there, yeah. I think there, there are there are moments uh, when you had this, you know, that when ordinary people, let's say, didn't care what was happening in the universities because that was just some uh, crazy egghead professors in the universities do, doing whatever they do. Yeah. But but at this point, when your child come home, comes home from school and and starts repeating some crazy uh, nonsense they, uh, they, they heard in school, uh, then, then you can no longer turn a blind eye to it. And I think more and more people, yeah. thinking people of all sorts are, are turning away from it, uh, not just politically conservative people, people, um, people with a, who are more of the classically liberal mind mindset of, um, of uh, the kind of liberal mindset that, uh, you know, Harold Bloom himself was was a liberal in, in a political yeah. sense, but, yeah. but that's that's not what we're talking about here. We're, we're not talking, talking about, about just yeah. thinking people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Alex, I want to ask you a very strange question. Could we model, if you agree, one of these days when you have time, could we take a short text and model that slow grappling with the text. We could certainly try. As an educational experience for something that you remember doing yeah. and I remember doing. Of course, <laughs> I'm not, I don't have degree. I, I'm an amateur reader. I love reading, but I, I will be a student open-minded student. Look, I, I, we're, we're, we're all amateur readers in, we're all the, best, amateur in, in, in the best sense. I also don't have a degree. I have a bachelor's <laughs> degree, but but in in, uh, in literature and beyond that, I have my law school degree, which uh, the less said about that, the better. But um, but uh, no, I think I think it's it's more the, the degree of any sort uh, is an informal degree just from lifelong learning um, yeah, that. but I think it will be amazing to try this with this use of technology just to take a poem, one poem or one something that you're passionate about, your personal taste, I don't know, Robert Frost or Baudelaire or something and show what can be done with it, what, what, what can be revealed from it. I'm all the to, layers. I am happy to try. Uh, we will see what happens, but I'm happy to try. <laughs> yes, this will be amazing. Well, Alex, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Hope it was useful for someone somewhere out there. Someone somewhere, definitely for me. And uh, it's very important to know that you're not alone in this. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. And I hope we meet again with actual text in our hands, with actual print, and we will do something fascinating without any other talks. Uh, that, that, that would be great. And, I, and you know, I, I would, I'd suggest to you to, do that not, not not with me, but even by yourself or with someone who you can talk to about this with with music. Meaning, um, I'm planning to yeah yeah just to do that modeling. Right. Yes, I don't know how it can be done through through.
through technology, but it's worth trying. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. Well, thank you, Alex. No, thank you very much for for inviting me. I enjoyed the conversation, obviously. Alex, I still have to figure out how to post links under the video. Do you want me to post any of the links for people to find you, to follow you, to read your writings? Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. You, you can do that. I, I, I assume since we discussed that that article a, a bunch, uh, the one that initially uh, introduced you to mm -hmm. me, I'm happy to convey that. And then I, you know, my Twitter, to the extent anyone cares about that kind of thing, uh, I'm happy to send that along. Um, so, yeah. Thank uh, you. But, but if you don't figure out the technology, Will not be a big I loss. will try <laughs> to. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. <laughs> and that's exciting. Thank you, Alex. I will you. see you soon. Yes. Bye. Bye bye. Away recording.